Richard, you've got 1.4 million followers on Twitter. Yeah. So we should start there. How did that happen? That was a bit of a freak of um, nature. Well, not of nature, just more of an accident where I was quite an early adopter with Twitter and I talked about it in the media and Twitter were very pleased with me. So they put me on their suggested user list and it was incredible. So I was on the front page of Twitter next to people like uh, Ashton Kutcher and it just shot right up. So I've ended up with a lot of followers, um, some of them all around the world. Is that, is that a giant burden of responsibility not to bore these people? I think that for a while it was a bit of a burden and you feel... And also I, I had a nighttime radio show when, when I first got onto Twitter and it was quite in a way that I can't on daytime radio. I would ask people to constantly follow me and that helped and it grew and grew. And it was like having these hungry mouths to feed. That's how I saw it in my head and I felt obliged to tweet. And right in the early days it was quite enjoyable putting up ironic, trivial stuff such as what restaurant you're in and what food you're eating. And now that's the the most hackneyed and boring cliche of Twitter. And also, did people start turning up? To, what? Sorry, to, to, to the restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> um, I did meet someone in a restaurant who said, "I've only come here because you recommended it on Twitter." Um, but uh, so it's, it's very boring now and hackneyed to put trivial stuff up on Twitter. I think, and and you realise actually over time they're not hungry mouths to feed. They're not waiting for your tweets. They don't care. And actually, I think the, one of the bigger mistakes you can make on Twitter is to tweet too much. If you tweet a lot, you'll annoy people and they'll stop following you. Whereas if you don't tweet much, they, were, they won't. And I think a lot of us who were quite early to Twitter and who've got quite a lot of followers have, have plateaued a bit. And if you look at a lot of the people with very big numbers who've been on it a while, they don't tweet that much. Um, and so it's, it's still in my life and it's still useful, but it's sort of receded into the background a bit. And I think it's in a more, if you like, it's in a more comfortable place now. Does it give you more power as a, as a broadcaster, uh, not, not, not just when you're on air, but in your negotiation with, uh, with, with doing programmes on, on TV channels and radio? Because you can say, I can bring 1.4 million people with me. I don't know, because, no, because people now understand. I, I think right in the early days of Twitter, people misunderstood Twitter and thought, yes, if you have a million followers, that means that you can tweet and perhaps a large portion of those people will do what you say. I think we now will understand that it doesn't work like that, that everyone follows a lot of people. And you don't see every tweet by everyone that you follow. So you, you go onto your phone and, you know, you might do it once every few hours and you just look at a few tweets that people have posted and put your phone down again. So only a tiny portion of the people that follow you will see each tweet that you write. And then only a tiny portion of that tiny portion are ever going to act upon what you say. Um, so it doesn't give you that much leverage. And I think people understand that. So I don't think it means you can suddenly get shows commissioned. Um, it becomes a bit annoying in terms of how many people ask you to retweet stuff. And I have, you know, I just have a lot of friends in the media who have TV shows on, and films out, and books out. I've got a lot of friends who open bars and restaurants. And they all ask me <laughs> to plug their stuff, which I will only do if I sincerely like uh, their work, because I think... I think you sort of have to be, um, yes, you have to be sincere in what you suggest, I guess. But that is where it, that is actually where it's annoying, is people co who know you've got a lot of followers constantly asking you to tweet about their stuff. Could you, uh, could you retweet this interview when you get a chance? <laughs> I know that's why I'm here, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> what I'm doing is piggybacking on your followers. And you're, you're going to send me an email, John, aren't you, and say, Richard, please RT. here's the link to that interview. Yeah, please RT. It's like turning down an autograph. The it's fan not. will never forgive you. But remember, I'll only do it if I sincerely like it. And based on how it's gone so far, I probably won't RT it. <laughs> but that's good news. That's good news. So, all right, enough about who follows you. Who do you follow? Give us, give us, uh, give us, your, give us your Desert Island Twitter. Um, no, there's no one. There are very few people who are really consistently funny all the time. And it's not... Present company, except. <laughs> uh, and... <laughs> That was funny. Oh, oh thanks. That's actually funnier than any of your tweets. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, I, it's, I don't really use it to make me laugh very much. I, I use it, it's, I, I'm a news junkie. And when there's a big news event, and if you're in a place where you can't see the television, so if there is, you know, a politician making a big speech, you know, if the Pope has just resigned or whatever it may be, it's A, useful for news commentators putting up updates constantly. And, and I like that. I like those sort of real-time feeds that you get. Uh, but it's also quite good as this kind of subversive director's commentary. So when the, what, so what struck me, actually, was when the Pope resigned, and it was the same week as 
also in a couple of weeks is horse meat, was I'm on Radio 5 Live. <coughs> and traditional media all treated the Pope's resignation with uh, incredible sincerity. And on Twitter, it was nothing but a joke. It was just a joke. And I thought there was this sort of fascinating gap between the way that we sort of have to speak to our audience about it and the way that Twitter speaks to its. And I can't, my feeling is that Twitter is much nearer how people really talk about news events. Um, I don't think people try and make as many jokes as commentators on Twitter do as soon as the Pope's resigned, but I think most people found humour in it. Uh, and so actually, this, I'm fascinated by this right now. I think people's reaction on Twitter to major news events is nearer how people out there talk about the news than we talk about the news on BBC radio and television and, and in papers like The Guardian. So lessons for broadcasters and news outlets to learn there if they're, if they're brave enough to take it. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, well, it's a very difficult lesson, isn't it? Because I, I, don't know how, I don't know how you learn that lesson. I don't know how, you know, Five Live is part rolling news. I, I don't quite know how you could instantly start and subvert a story like The Pope. And you kind of have to treat horse meat fairly seriously, certainly when it breaks. Um, so I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know what that lesson would be. It may just be that the two things coexist. Uh, perhaps they coexist very comfortably. But as I say, I think the way people react on Twitter to big stories is much nearer how people talk about how, how people everywhere else react to them. Horses for courses. Not as funny. <laughs> Don't tweet right. that. I'm right. not RTing that.